Hello Internet! This is the fifth part in our series about the free boson. You can find links to the previous parts in the description below. This time we are going to look at light cone coordinates, which will afford us another look at the right and left moving modes that we discussed last time. This time it will be a more elegant way, like the one taken by more grown-up physicists in books like this one. But before we continue, if these videos are in any way useful to you, let me know in a comment. Because you see the, the views on these videos are very low and declining, and so I'm kind of questioning whether they are useful to anybody. So if you get something out of it, let me know. Also, just like me, you may be waiting impatiently for the quantum theory of the free boson to come up. And it will be coming soon, but we still need a couple of episodes to discuss some prerequisites before we get there. This is a good place to mention that I picked all of our conventions such that our results will line up exactly with the ones in Barton Zwieberg's uh, string theory course. For example, our expansion of the field in terms of right moving and left moving modes that we ended up last time is exactly the same as this formula in Zwieberg's book for the mode expansion of one of the coordinates of the Poisonic string, with only a few minor changes in notation that are as follows. First, as is usual in closed string theory, Zwieberg sets the spatial period L to 2 pi, which makes sense because in string theory what we call the x-coordinate is in a dimensionless coordinate on the word sheet, so it can be set to a dimensionless number like 2 pi, getting rid of all these annoying factors of 2 pi over L. Second, he uses the uh, Regis slope alpha prime, which is defined as follows. So alpha prime is the same as 1 over 2 pi the string tension and with these two replacements, our factor here of square root of TL downstairs becomes a factor of square root of, um, sorry, this one, square root of alpha prime upstairs. The second change is that um, instead of X, Zwieber uses sigma. Instead of t, he uses tau. And the part in front here is, of course, our zero mode that we have called here uppercase A naught t. And we already have seen in previous episodes that A naught of t is such an affine function of time. And in this episode, we will actually discuss the treatment of the zero mode a bit and how we can um, unify its treatment somewhat with the other modes. It cannot be unified completely because in contrast to the other modes, the zero mode is not oscillating with time. Finally, uh, the dummy index that we called k is called n here in Zwieber's formula. And what we called a k naught is called alpha n in Zwiebach. And because he treats multiple of these bosonic fields, because the string has multiple coordinates in space time, there is also an index mu that we don't have because we treat only one free boson, not multiple ones. And with that, you should be easily be able to show that our result is actually exactly the same as the one that Zwiebach gets here for the bosonic open string, which is one of the most important applications of the theory of free bosons that we are discussing right now. Textbooks like Zwiebach's use a more direct way to end up with this result that starts right away from the equations of motion. Recall that in our definition of the right-moving and left-moving modes, 
We only applied knowledge about the dynamics from the equations of motions in the very last step by replacing ak, which was a function of t, by ak at time zero times an exponential of time in the very last step of our derivation. I did this in order to show that the right and left moving modes can be defined in the Hamiltonian framework without assuming any knowledge about the dynamics of the field. This time we will do the opposite. We will start right from the equation of motion. The equation of motion of our field was the following, namely that the second partial derivative of the field with respect to time minus the second partial derivative of the field with respect to x is zero. And this holds for all x and t in our space-time manifold. Let's first rewrite this in terms of applying a differential operator to our field. We will write it as applying the differential operator second partial derivative with respect to t minus second partial derivative with respect to x applied to the field phi equals zero. And this differential operator is simply defined to give exactly this function. There is an interesting way to write this differential operator that looks a bit like um, the factorization of this as a product, namely the following. We can write this as partial derivative by t minus partial derivative by x applied to the partial derivative with respect to t plus the partial derivative with respect to x of the field phi is zero. And this looks a bit like a multiplication, but it's actually, actually this multiplication is defined by composition of the differential operator. So it means that we first apply this differential operator to phi, and then we apply this differential operator to the result that we got. And overall, what we get must be zero. So uh, let's check that these equations are actually the same by multiplying out the differential operator, which really means applying the functional composition. So if we apply the first operator here, let's first leave the this operator unchanged. So we have dt d by dt minus d by dx. Okay, so what do we get if we apply this to phi? We get d phi by dt plus d phi by dx. That's just the definition of this operator applied. Zero. And now we apply this differential operator to this function. And we get the following. So the d by dt gives us the second partial derivative with respect to t. Um, here we get plus second partial derivative. This is a mixed one. So first by dx, then by dt. Then from this we get minus another mixed differential, second derivative of phi, first here by dt, then by dx. And finally, minus from this hitting this, we get the second partial derivative with respect to x. And this is zero. And we see here because partial derivatives commute with each other, this term is exactly the negative of this term. So these cancel each other. And we end up exactly with the equation we started out with.
I should mention here that this is to be understood as an equality of functions on our space-time manifold. So it means that whenever you evaluate this function here for any arbitrary x and t, you get the same as when you evaluate the function that is a constant zero at x and t. So what have we gained by expressing our equation of motion in this funny way by applying first one and then another differential operator to the field? Well, to make this more clear, let's define new variables to replace x and t. We define a variable u as t plus x and a variable v as t minus x. In a space-time diagram where we have x coordinate horizontally and the t coordinate vertically, the coordinate axes corresponding to these new variables go at angles of 45 degrees with respect to the ones for our old variables. So the u axis would be this one and the v axis would be this one. These new coordinate axes are neither space-like nor time-like. They are exactly something in between which is called light-like because remember that we discussed last time that waves moving with the speed of light move exactly along lines of 45 degrees in our space-time diagram as a result of us working in natural units where the speed of light in vacuum is the dimensionless number one. So these coordinate axes u and v go exactly along lines of the propagation of waves that move with, with the speed of light. And together they, they form this shape that looks like an X and which is in general called the light cone. We can express our field in these new variables u and v by defining an object phi uv that is a function of u and v as follows. The value of this new function for any given u and v shall be the same as phi at x is expressed as a function of u and v and t expressed as a function of u and v. With these functions being just the inverses of this coordinate transformation, which we can quickly write down. So t is one half u plus v and x is one half u minus v. So if we plug these in here, we get this. And our new field phi v and v is defined by this equation holding for all u and v in r cos r. And I should warn you that in the physics literature it's quite common to not uh, denote this transformed field by a new name. It's just simply called phi like the original field and the distinction between the different functions is made by simply by the names of the arguments or by some other contextual information. In order to see what happens to the differential operators in terms of our new variables, we simply need to calculate the partial derivatives of our newly defined function. So let's calculate d phi u v by d u. We do this by straightforward application of the chain rule. So this will be 
the partial derivative of phi with respect to its first argument, which is x, times the derivative of x regarded as a function of u and v by u <coughs> plus the derivative of phi with respect to its second argument t times <coughs> t regarded as a function of u and v by u and we know these derivatives we can calculate them directly from the variable definition and what we get is that this derivative of the new field by u is one half d phi by dx this here plus d phi by dt from here and in a similar way we can calculate the v derivative so this is <coughs> d phi by dx times dx by dv plus d phi by dt times dt by dv which turns out to be <coughs> one half d phi by dt minus <coughs> d phi by dx and to make this more nicely I should have written this in the other order so let's write this as d phi by dt plus d phi by dx this minus sign simply comes from the derivative of x with respect to v being minus one half. These equations hold for any function phi of x and t that is transformed to a function of u and v according to this definition and we will therefore regard these equations as equations between the corresponding differential operators that is we will say that d by du equals one half d by dt plus d by dx and d by dv equals one half d by dt minus d by dx given these identities of differential operators we can re-express our equation of motion using the new variables and we see that our equation of motion is the same as 4 times d by dv d by du of phi uv being equal to zero and we can immediately divide this by the non-zero constant 4 to clean it up and as is common in the physics literature we will from now on also refer to the field phi expressed as a function of u and v simply as phi with the understanding that whenever we talk about the variables u and v functions of x and t are transformed to u and v according to this definition now this new form of our equation of motion is really nice because for one thing it allows us to immediately write down a family of solutions to this equation namely that we can write the field phi in the following way it is the sum of a function phi l that depends only on u plus a function phi r that depends 
only on V. And let's quickly show that for any function phi L of U and any function phi R of V, this is actually a solution to this equation. You simply plug it in. dV by du of this, that is dV by du of phi L plus dV by du of phi R. Now we ask whether this is zero. <coughs> now one thing we can do is we can commute these partial derivatives here. So we have d by du of d by dv phi l plus d by dv of d by du of phi r. And now we see phi l is by definition a function only of u and it doesn't depend on v. So this partial derivative here will be zero. Likewise phi r is defined to be only a function of v, it has no u dependence. Therefore this partial derivative is also going to be zero. And therefore of course the whole expression is identically zero. So we have shown that any function that can be written in this way as a sum of a function that only depends on u and a function that only depends on v is a solution to our equation of motion. Furthermore, we will now show that this family of solutions is actually the general solution. That is, any function that solves this equation of motion can be written in this form. To do this, let's assume we have a function phi that satisfies this equation. We can write this in a slightly different way as that the derivative, partial derivative by dv of the function partial of phi with respect to u is identically zero. And the important point is that this is an identity of functions. That is, the v derivative of this function is zero everywhere for any value of the variables u and v. By the, the mean value theorem, uh, this implies that this fu function actually does not depend on v at all. So we can write that partial of phi with respect to u evaluated at uv is equal to some function f that only depends on u evaluated at u. And this holds for all uv in r cross r. In this statement, the variable u that appears here and here and here is simply a dummy variable, so we can rename it to anything we like. So let's rename it to u prime. This statement is valid for all v in the real numbers, but we will now choose an arbitrary but fixed real number v. And for this number v, we will integrate this equation over d u prime from 0 to u. So on the left hand side, we get the integral from 0 to u over d u prime of d phi by du evaluated at u prime comma v and by the main theorem of calculus 
this is actually the same as phi evaluated at u comma v minus phi evaluated at zero comma v okay and on the right hand side we get the integral from zero to u over du prime of f evaluated at u prime. This is, whatever this is, it is a function of u. And we will now simply by definition call this function of u phi l of u. So this just defines our function phi l as this integral expression. I copied our result here to make some space and now the only remaining step is to bring this term to the other side of the equation. So in the end we get that phi evaluated at u comma v is equal to our function phi l evaluated at u plus phi evaluated at 0 comma v and now we simply call this part phi r of v because this is just a function that only depends on v and we define phi r to be this, be this function and so we end up with exactly this result that we have successfully expressed our field as the sum of a function only depending on u and another function only depending on v. Graphically our proof that any field phi obeying the equation of motion can be expressed in this way is quite easy to understand. What we have demonstrated here is that for any point u comma v we can simply project this uh, point to the v-axis, this pro projection being parallel to the u-axis, and then we find that the value of the field at this point u, v is the value of the field at this point that is phi evaluated at 0 comma v plus the difference between this value and this value and this difference turns out to only depend on u so only on where the point is when we project it to the u axis because what the equation of motion effectively says is that differences in u do not depend on v. So the difference between this point and this point is the same, for example, as the difference in the field value between this point and this point, or this point and this point, and so on, with these points all lying on the same line parallel to the v-axis. Now that we have established that the general solution to our equation of motion is of this form, some remarks are in order. First, let's take a look at what this means with respect to the variables t and x that we used earlier. So, it simply means that the field at x and t can be written as phi l of t plus x, t plus x being our definition of u, plus phi r evaluated at t minus x. And here we are using the physical convention of using the same letter phi for the field expressed in different coordinate systems. If you just see it as a mathematical function of two arguments, this phi here denotes a different function 
phi uv. But physically, it denotes the same field phi, just expressed in different coordinate systems. Last time we already discussed that a function that depends only on t plus x is a left-moving function in space-time. And similarly, a function that only depends on t minus x is a right-moving function in space-time, as we visualized uh, the last time. Therefore, we have proven that any solution to the equations of motion can be decomposed as the sum of a left-moving and a right-moving function in space-time. The next remark is that, quite obviously, this decomposition of the solution is not completely unique, because once we have one such composition, we can easily create a different one by adding a constant to phi L and subtracting the constant, the same constant from phi R, and evidently we get exactly the same field phi of X and T. But there is an important constraint that we have not yet considered, and that is the periodicity of our field in the X coordinate. Recall that we demanded that phi at x plus l and t be the same as phi at x and t for all x and t in r cross r. So what does this periodicity imply for our functions phi l and phi r? Well, let's simply plug this in into this form of the equation. So we get phi L T plus X plus L. This is just simply plugging in this value here for the X in this equation. Plus phi R of T minus X plus L. has to be the same as phi L at t plus x. This is now expanding this side of the equation using this one plus phi R at t minus x. Let's now replace t plus x and t minus x by our definitions of u equal t plus x and v equals t minus x. So we can rewrite this, which, by the way, this is also valid for all x and t in r cross r. So we rewrite this using u and v, and we get that phi l u plus l plus phi r here we have t minus x, that is v minus l, if we resolve this parenthesis, shall be equal to phi l of u plus phi r of v. Okay, so let's uh, bring the phi l terms on the same side. We have phi l u plus l minus phi l at u shall be equal to phi r at v minus phi r at v minus l. And these equations are valid for all u and v in R cross R. And because this is qualified as being valid for all uh, of these, the, the V uh, is only a dummy variable. So let's just rename it here to V prime.
And now we make the replacement uh, that V prime is V plus L. So for any arbitrary V prime, we can just define V such that this is the case. And what we get in the end is that phi L of U plus L minus phi L at U must be the same as phi R at V plus L minus phi R at V. This is a constraint that the solution of the equation has to satisfy in order to represent a field that is periodic in space as we have initially demanded. One way to understand it is that the difference on the left hand side expresses the failure of the function phi L to P periodic with period L and the right hand side expresses the failure of the function phi R to P periodic in V with period L and our constraint says that both of these functions must fail to be periodic by exactly the same amount. And also note that the left hand side depends only on u as a free variable and the right hand side depends only on v. But since they must always be equal, it means that really this value that is expressed here cannot depend on either u or v. So importantly, this value, this failure of the functions to be periodic, must be a constant. Independent of the variables u and v. To better understand the implications of this constraint, we will now differentiate this equation with respect to u and with respect to v respectively. So let's first differentiate it with respect to u. On the left hand side we will get d phi l by du evaluated at u plus l minus d phi l by du evaluated at u. I wrote the normal derivative because phi l is just a function of a single argument so we don't need to use partial derivatives and on the right side so both from here and consistently from here we simply get zero because we have no dependence on u at all on this side. Analogously if we differentiate by v, we get 0 from here and consistently also from here. And for this we get d phi r by, sorry, by dv evaluated at v plus l minus d phi r by dv evaluated at v and this equation holds for all u in r and this holds for all v in r. So we see that the derivative of phi l is simply a periodic function with period l and likewise the derivative of phi r is also a periodic function with the same period L. We already know from the previous parts that this means that we can expand these functions in terms of Fourier series. So let's do this now. The only difference is that this time we will do it like the grown-ups and immediately write down a complex Fourier series for these functions. So let's write down
TFAL by DU in terms of its Fourier series. So this evaluated at U shall be the sum over the integers. So for a complex Fourier series, we go both over negative and positive numbers here. We have some coefficients. Uh, we will name them for the left moving function. We will name them lowercase a bar with an index k. And actually, let's call these coefficients lowercase a bar k of zero. So in the context of this Fourier series, this is just a complicated name of the variable. But of course, we choose this name because this object will in the end turn out to be exactly what we called by this name so far. And um, this is the coefficient of e to the, to the minus i k u times 2 pi over l to get something that has period l. And we will also add a constant factor to all of this. And we run over the square root of 2TL, which again only has the purpose to unify this object later with the left moving modes that we have already defined in previous parts. For building the Fourier series, this constant factor does not matter because it could always be absorbed into the coefficients. Likewise, we will have for the right moving function d phi r by dv at v will be, in this case, we call the coefficients lowercase a k without the bar, and the exponential will also depend on v. As in the end, we want our field phi to be real valued. We will also want these functions to be real valued. Well, we could uh, allow some imaginary part for phi l and phi r, but these imaginary parts would have to be negatives of each other so that they cancel when we add these parts together to create the field phi. And therefore, these imaginary parts would simply be redundancies in the description. We will therefore just formulate our reality conditions such that these functions turn out to be real. And for a complex Fourier series, this condition is the following. We will demand as a reality condition that a bar minus k is the same as the complex conjugate of a k for all k in the integers. And likewise, we will have the reality condition for the unbarred coefficients. If you are at all unsure how these reality conditions work, just observe that in this series, when we go from a term with positive k to the corresponding negative k, given that these conditions hold, the term just turns into the complex conjugate of the term for the positive k. That means that the sum that goes over all the integers will always add to each term for a positive k the complex conjugate of this term. And if you add a number and its complex conjugate, the outcome is just twice the real part without any imaginary part. In order to get our function phi l from this, we simply need to integrate this over u. And in order to do this, let's first separate out the term for k equals zero, because this will need slightly different treatment than the other terms. 
So let's write this as the term with k equals zero. In this case, this exponential simply turns into one and we have a bar naught zero over square root of two TL plus the other terms one over square root two TL times the sum over all non-zero integers of a bar k zero times the exponential. So let's integrate this. We get that phi L of u is some constant of integration, which we will simply write as one half phi L naught, just to make the end result come out nice. This is just an arbitrary real integration constant. Plus, so let's first integrate the a naught term. That's very easy. We just get one over square root two TL a naught bar zero times u plus now we integrate the rest constant factor in front times the sum over the non-negative integers of a k bar zero. This is just acting as a constant. And for the exponential, we get one over minus i k two pi over l times the exponential. Uh, let's clean this up slightly. So we get the constant of integration plus this linear term plus, and here we will move the minus i out front and upstairs. So we get plus i over square root of 2tl times the sum over the non-negative non integers times a bar k of zero times one over k times two pi over l e to the minus i k u two pi over l. We get a very similar result for phi r it just has its own independent constant of integration that we will call one half phi r naught and it depends on v instead of u and it has its own set of coefficients that we will call a sub k of zero. By construction, the derivatives of these functions are periodic with period l and this was a necessary condition for our periodicity condition to hold. However, it is not quite a sufficient condition. To get the full set of constraints, we will now plug in our functions phi L and phi R into this constraint. And this turns out to be actually quite simple because first the constant terms will simply cancel in these subtractions and also the periodic terms of this series expansion will cancel because of being periodic with period L. So the only thing remains comes from these linear terms. On the left hand side, we get one over square root of two TL times A naught bar of zero times L has to be equal and to what we get on the right side, 
is 1 over square root of 2 tr times a naught of 0 times l. And <clears throat> once we divide out all the non-zero constants, we simply get that a naught bar has to be the same as a naught. This constraint, together with this form of construction of the functions phi l and phi r, is sufficient to guarantee that our periodicity constraint holds. This is an interesting result because it tells us that in our decomposition of the field into its left-moving and its right-moving part, these parts are not completely independent from each other. They are coupled by this one constraint that says that this one coefficient must have the same value in both functions. Let's now work out the final result that we get for the expansion of our field by plugging in the left-moving and right-moving parts. We get that the field is as follows. So first, let's add the constant parts here. That gives a half phi naught L plus phi naught R. Then let's add the linear parts using our constraint that A naught has to be equal to A bar naught. This gives us 1 over the square root of 2 TL times A naught of 0 times U plus V. And then we add these uh, series expansions. We have a constant factor of i over square root of 2 tl times sum over the non-zero integers. Times 1 over k times 2 pi over l times a k of 0 times e to the minus i k v 2 times 2 pi over l plus a bar k of 0 times e to the minus i k u 2 pi over l. And let's convert this back to our original variables x and t. We get phi at xt equals here we get that u plus v is simply 2 times t. So we get 2 times t. We can actually clean this up to be 2 over tl, square root of 2 over tl. And here we simply must insert the definitions of v and u. So v is t minus x and u is t plus x. Let's compare this result to the expansion that we ended up with in the previous episode. We see that the right and left moving parts are exactly the same and the zero mode is, as we already knew, an affine, affine function of time, that is, it is a constant plus a linear function of time. And we note 
that only the sum of our integration constants phi naught L plus phi naught R has an influence on the zero mode. This corresponds with the ambiguity of the left moving and right moving part that we had discussed previously. That is, the left moving and right moving part are only defined up to a constant that we can divide arbitrarily between the left and the right moving part. And this is exactly what we see here. So um, how we divide up the constant of the zero mode into a left moving and right moving part has no influence on what we get for the field overall. This redundancy is the flip side of the constraint that we have that the left moving and the right moving function are not quite independent from each other but they must have the same A0 coefficient. If we want we can remove the ambiguity in these constants simply by choosing them to be equal. We set them to the same constant phi naught in the real numbers and with this choice this part simply becomes the constant phi naught. To summarize with this simplification our expansion of the field looks like this and by introducing the light cone coordinates u and v we could decompose our field into left, a left and a right moving part and doing this we could at least partially unify the zero mode with the other modes at least in the expressions for the partial derivatives d phi by du and d phi by dv. These derivatives of the field by the light cone coordinates have a noticeably nicer structure than the field itself because we see in these derivatives the zero mode uh, is unified with the other modes by a series that goes over all integers including zero. This unification also works for our reality conditions that we can now write for all integers k including zero and note that for k equals zero these conditions just state that the constant a naught appearing for the zero mode has to be a real number. In, the, in addition we need that our constant phi naught also must be a real number. Let's also connect these ideas to what we said about conditions that uniquely fix the field for all x and t. In previous episodes we already saw that specifying the field at a reference time and its time derivative at a reference time in form of two independent periodic functions uniquely fixes the field for all uh, times and all x. Alternatively we could um, use the classical variational principle and specify the field at two different reference times and also by periodic functions and in this way fix it for all space and time. Now we have an additional way by fixing the two functions phi L and phi R we can uniquely fix the field however these functions are not quite independent uh, they must be periodic functions up to the zero mode that they contain and for the zero mode we have this constraint that connects these two functions by requiring that the coefficient a naught be equal to a bar naught. If you like this video please subscribe and comment and if you have any questions also put them in the comments. See you next time.